Okay, um, so welcome everybody. Uh, we're very happy today to have Mark Armstrong from Oxford as our speaker and Dirk Bergerman from Yale uh, as discussant. So before we uh, have the presentation, let me just quickly recap the rules of the seminar. Um, so Mark will speak for around 45 minutes, Dirk for around five minutes, and that will leave up to 10 minutes of time at the end for Q&A. If you do have any questions, um, please type them in the chat during the talk. I'll stop Mark perhaps two or three times as we go along, and then I'll mainly focus on clarification questions, and I'll leave broader questions and comments for the Q&A at the end. Um, lastly, just bear in mind that we are recording, so if you do want to be on the recording, um, please don't ask a question. Um, I think that's everything. So again, we're very happy to have Mark, who's going to present patterns of competitive interaction with John Vickers. So Mark, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, nice to see you. And uh, 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 it's the first time I've given one of these online seminars. So excuse me if you have a little bit uh, uh, wooden or something like that. I'm used to sort of uh, seeing the smiles or groans from the audience when I actually give a seminar. Uh, so anyway, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. This is a started off, it's, I've been doing this paper with John for a while now. Uh, so some of you would have seen some previous iteration of it. Uh, but during lockdown, we did make quite a bit of progress, I hope. So we, even if you've seen it before, I hope there's uh, uh, enough new material to keep you going. Here. Okay. So this is uh, patterns of competitive interaction. Uh, let me move down to the next slide. So it's a basically a very classical IO sort of paper. Could have We could have tried to write it 30 years ago or 40 years ago, uh, but we're doing it now instead. Uh, and we uh, imagine that the model is that we've got consumers and they, are interested in buying the cheapest firm that they are uh, is in their consideration set. Okay, uh, that's the model. And the only way that consumers differ is by which firms they consider for their purchase. They have the same tastes or anything like that. Okay, it's just uh, uh, the consideration set is the only source of heterogeneity across consumers. So we've got a little sort of Venn diagram on this top of the slide there. And that's just to show sort of a simple market with three firms. Um, so I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the cursor people living in this segment are captive to uh, this firm here, firm one, say. These people are captive to firm two. These people are captive to firm three. These people up here are willing to buy from either firm one or firm two, but not firm three. And these sort of very uh, savvy types, if you like, are willing to buy, oops, what's going on? Sorry, are willing to buy from all three firms. Okay, so that's, and you can imagine different fractions of people living in these different parts of the Venn diagram. So that's a sort of general way of uh, showing the patterns of consideration for the three firms in that market. And you can imagine that with N firms uh, just as well. Okay, why do, why do consumers have different consideration sets? Well, there's lots of reasons. Uh, they might just differ in the awareness of the firms in the market. Local people know more sellers than people who just arrive as a tourist, that kind of story. Uh, you might have consumers looking for a mortgage, say, some fairly homogeneous product like that. And different consumers have different propensity to search for good offers. So someone might only look for one mortgage offer, some might look for two, et cetera, et cetera. That's just their reflected in their search costs. Um, personalized search algorithms like Google, uh, they will give different search results even when people key in the same search terms. So that would be another way of seeing different firms uh, in the market. Okay, there are lots of different ways. I've got a few bullet points down there. You might only want to buy from a supermarket within a certain distance from you. That would be another way, a more spatial kind of story. Um, you might be sort of have an incumbent firm. Some people are willing to switch to a lower price offer from a rival, but some people are more inert and more just sort of captive to their incumbent firm. So there's all kinds of stories like that. Uh, you might have different ability to compare prices. Uh, 
So some people might be savvier and easily see which is the cheapest deal on the, in the market. Some people might, because of presentational issues or framing or whatever it might be, uh, different consumers might get confused and end up buying more randomly and they'll be sort of captive to the firm that they buy from. Okay, so those are the sorts of stories we're talking about. Okay, this is a relatively short presentation, so I'm not going to go into too much more motivation, but it's just a classical model of competition between firms. Firms are differ in how many consumers they reach, uh, but they essentially offer the same product with the same cost. Okay, so that's going to be the story. In more detail, uh, what's the model? The model is that there is uh, a number of firms. They don't have any cost, just normalized to zero. And maybe the crucial assumption in all this paper is that there's no endogenous search or anything like that going on. People are just uh, born with their consideration set. Okay, so you've got uh, exogenous patterns of consideration in the market. At the end, time permitting, I'll say what you might do to endogenize some of that. Okay, but you know, it's the usual story. This is even if you had endogenous consideration, what I'm going to describe will be a necessary ingredient into understanding what goes on. Okay, so that's the usual easy way of getting out of this obviously very restrictive assumption that people can't search for another firm or firms can't advertise to more consumers. Uh, it's just all exogenous. Okay, just for terminology, uh, say that a consumer is reached by firm I if that consumer considers firm I. So she's inside that circle on the Venn diagram, if you like. And a consumer is captive to firm I if she considers that firm, but no other firm. And a sort of useful way of measuring uh, willingness to set prices by a firm is the what we call the captive to reach ratio, which is the, the fraction of a firm's reach which is captive. Okay, so if those sort of outlying segments on the Venn diagram are big relative to the circle, then that has a big, a large captive to reach ratio. Uh, a consumer, as I say, they all the same except for what firms they consider. They're all willing to pay up to one for a unit of the product. And they will just buy from the firm in her career consideration set with the lowest price, provided that price is no greater than one. Uh, each firm sets a uniform price to all its consumers. So it just doesn't know or it's not allowed to discriminate based on where a consumer is in that Venn diagram. Okay. John and I have another paper or published now, which talks about the case where you can condition prices on whether someone is captive or not, for instance. Okay, that's not nothing of that in that in this paper now. And firms compete in prices. It's just a, now a standard Bertrand model in just in a one-shot interaction. Okay, so it's the simplest possible competitive model. Uh, okay, uh, two assumptions just to make the model a little interesting uh, and they're just very minimal assumptions so there are some consumers that consider more than one firm so there is some competition in the market uh, secondly got a slightly complicated way of putting it but essentially this one says that there are some captive customers as well okay uh, more generally it says that if you've got some subset of firms there's always one firm there which reaches consumers that are reached by no other firm. Okay, so that's that's knocking out slightly extreme configurations where say two firms reach exactly the same pool of consumers. Their circles completely coincide. We're ruling that kind of thing out because those two firms will then set competitive prices uh, deterministically. Okay, so those are the two fairly minimal assumptions. There's some competition, but not perfect competition is the way to think about it. Uh, and with those assumptions, the only possible equilibria are going to involve mixed pricing strategies. Okay, uh, another way of calling that would be price dispersion in the market. Okay, so we're going to think of firms as choosing not a price, but a range of prices, the support of prices that they're willing to offer in the market. And we're going to be focusing on what the pattern of those ranges of prices are uh, in terms of the underlying pattern of consideration in the market. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the framework. 
Uh, I'll stop in a couple of slides just to pick up any uh, clarifying questions, but let me just press on with the presentation of the model and then I'll present some uh, actual results. Okay, so what are the sort of uh, features of a of a equilibrium, this Bertrand equilibrium? Well, I've set it up so that the uh, famous theorem in Das Gupta and Maskin apply, and there is always an equilibrium, as I say, in mixed strategies in this mark. Okay, so there's no worry about that. Um, what else is sort of a bit obvious? Uh, well, each firm is going to make equilibrium profit at least equal to the number of captive customers it has because that firm could always set a price of one and sell at least to its captive customers. So that's its sort of a reservation profit and generally it can do that or strictly more. Okay, and in fact, you can show that there's got to be one firm that makes exactly that profit. Uh, thirdly, no firm is ever going to set too low a price. Uh, in particular, it will never set a price below its captive to reach ratio because it can guarantee itself the captive profit. And if it sets a price below the captive to reach ratio, even in the extreme case it sells to everyone that considers it, it will make less profit than it did just by setting price equal to one. So the captive to reach ratio is a flaw on the prices that any given firm is going to charge. Okay, there aren't any atoms in the mixed strategy except possibly at the monopoly price P equal one. Okay, uh, and that essentially is going to mean that a firm's demand function is going to be a continuous function of its price. Okay. P naught, that's going to be the minimum price ever charged in the market. The sum firm that's going to have P naught in its support, and no firm's going to charge a price below that. If that's the minimum price, then every price between P naught and the monopoly price of one is going to be chosen by at least two firms in the market. Okay. Why is that? Well, if, if a firm I chooses some price P, uh, it's got to have something constraining it from increasing that price. And the only thing that could constrain it is having another firm in the market, which is charging prices around that level as well. Okay. Otherwise it would want to shift up its price uh, to some extent. So you've got to always have a firm is always facing competition at any price that it's in its support. Uh, so that's the uh, basic uh, idea there. And because of that duopoly, is really special in this kind of market, okay? Duopoly, uh, if you just read through those bullet points, duopoly, you just know immediately that the equilibrium is gonna have both firms choosing from the same interval of prices, okay? Even if they're asymmetric, even if one firm doesn't have any captive customers, they're gonna choose from the same interval of prices, okay? Uh, all the interesting stuff happens when we have more than two firms in the market. So in some sense, it's very different from Corneau or standard Bertrand where, well, it's very different from Corneau where if you can understand two firms, you understand three firm interactions, etc. Here, there's a big step up when you go from two to more than two firms in the market. Okay, something we'll talk about in, a, again, a very classical IO way is what happens with obvious comparative statics. So the obvious comparative statics are entry, what happens when a new firm enters the market, and how do we model entry? We're gonna think of entry as just adding another circle onto a Venn diagram, okay? It's superimposing a circle onto the existing Venn diagram. And that means uh, that, you know, the, the people who consider the incumbent firms, they're not affected at all. Uh, uh, the pattern of consideration for the incumbent firms is unaffected by entry. There's nothing like choice overload going on in this market or anything like that, where having another firm means that people are less easy, find it less easy to, to compare incumbent firms or anything like that. Nothing, going, nothing behavioral like that going on. Okay, so it's just think of it as adding a circle on top of an existing Venn diagram. It doesn't affect the reach of any incumbent firm, if you think about it but it will in general reduce the number of captive customers it has. Okay, if entry is costless, it's got, it can't decrease total welfare because in this very stark model of unit demand, welfare is just the 
total number of people that are reached by any firm in the market. And that's going to go up when you have entry. Okay, exit, on the other hand, is just removing a circle. The other thing you can do in our sort of set theory kind of way of thinking of the market is what's a merger? And a merger is just the union of two circles on the Venn diagram. Okay, firm I and firm J just combine their reaches uh, and they have a new big circle that's the union of the two previous circles. Okay, and it, if you think of it that way, that has an assumption that the merge firm is gonna charge the same price in both circles, okay? It's not like there's two brands which are merging but keep a separate identity and possibly separate prices. We're not, we're not gonna have it, that story, okay? So a merge firm's combined reach is going to decrease. You know, you've got two, two circles and now you've just got one and the overlap is only counted once now. So the combined reach goes down with a merger. On the other hand, the combined captive base goes up with a merger because you've got uh, the duopoly segment between those two firms is now captive to the merged firm. And because of that, if a merger has no cost synergies, it doesn't have any impact on welfare in this, again, very stark framework. Okay, and the questions we want to sort of try and think about with this framework are, how does the pattern of consideration affect the pattern of price competition? Okay, the primitive thing is our Venn diagram. How does that map into patterns of price competition. So in particular, who, which firm competes against which firm in equilibrium? You know, it's, uh, they might share customers, but they might not necessarily compete. They might offer prices from different ranges. Uh, so who competes against whom in equilibrium? When do firms offer a similar range of prices? That's like duopoly, you always have that. Uh, and when is price competition more segmented so that only a few firms charge any given price. We know that we have to have at least two firms charging a given price. That's a, a fact of this model. Uh, but maybe you only have two firms charging a given price. That would be a sort of duopolistic kind of uh, uh, competition. Okay, so we're really looking for a map between the primitive Venn diagram to an equilibrium Venn diagram of which firms choose which prices. Uh, that's what we're looking for. Uh, another thing that's going to be important is how to measure the interaction between pairs of firms or sets of firms. And that's roughly speaking going to be the overlap over their circles in the Venn diagram. But we need to talk about it precisely to have results about that. So what's, what's going to be the measure of interaction between firms in the market? And finally, just returning to entry and merger, is entry always going to be good for consumers? Uh, and is a profitable merger always going to be bad for consumers in this particular framework? So that's the, that's the uh, set of things we want to talk about. And I'll talk about it in various special cases as I go through the remainder of the talk. Uh, do you want me to pause for a minute, Andrew, and uh, see if anything, any clarifying questions? I think every, so far everything is good. Everything is clear. No questions. Perfect. That's, uh, uh, I'll trust you to interrupt me if there are any clarifying things that I can, uh, I can uh, clarify. Okay, I will press on in that case. Okay, so I haven't really given you a, a literature overview. I'm going to give you a very rudimentary one here. Um, and I'll mention a couple of other things as I go through. But Obviously, this isn't a new, remotely a new thing to think about as, as economists. Uh, there's been loads of thousands of papers talking about this topic in the past. Uh, but they have been grouped into particular special kinds of special patterns of consideration. Okay, so what are the things that we understand now? It would be the, if you like, the case of symmetric firms. Uh, and, uh, and sort of 95% of existing papers have symmetric firms in this framework. Okay, so in particular, symmetric and randomly considered firms. So that means that a certain number of people only consider one firm, they're the captive customers. A certain number of people might consider two random firms, et cetera, et cetera. So that is uh, included in that category is the famous paper of sales by Varian and the more general version uh, of noisy search by Bedet and Judd. Okay, so those are, those are well understood. 
there is a symmetric equilibrium. It's not always unique, uh, but we know how to talk about that. Uh, duopoly, in particular asymmetric duopoly, where the two firms might be very different sizes, uh, was studied by Nara Simhan. Uh, and again, as I've said already, the outcome there is that both firms use the same range of prices. Uh, a more, a less well-known thing, but really neat, is the case of independent reach, uh, which is where each firm, you know, the fact that I'm a consumer, I consider firm I, uh, that doesn't have any impact on whether the probability that I consider firm J. Okay, so that's just the case where the event of uh, considering a particular firm are independent events uh, in the market. Okay, and that was studied uh, independently, if you like, by these two papers by Norman Ireland and Preston McAfee. Okay, and they, they you know, that's, they, those papers deserve to be better known, I'd say. They're not particularly well cited, but they really uh, get to the heart of a lot of these questions. Okay, and all of these three cases, which are the sort of existing models, if you like, are special cases of a general pattern of consideration that we're going to call symmetric interaction. Okay, and they all look quite similar, those three, and the reason why is that they all fall under this general group, that we, I'll explain what it is shortly, of symmetric interaction. On the bottom of half of the slide, uh, I've got two sort of more exotic kinds of uh, interact of consideration, if you like. On the left one, we've got what's called nested reach. That's where only the largest firm has got any captive customers. Everywhere else lies inside that largest firm. Uh, and they sort of go in like a, a bullseye uh, inwards from the circle. Okay, so why, would, why might that be worth considering? Well, imagine consumers consider their options in order. Some people only look at the first option presented to them on a search results page, say. Some people only look at the first two. Some people only look at the first three. That would give you a pattern of nested reach, like on that picture there. Okay, on the right-hand picture, you, what you might call a chain store kind of interaction, where there's one big firm interacting with a number of local disjoint rivals. Uh, uh, that's, again, a classic kind of uh, IO market. And keep those two pictures in mind because I'll just describe what happens in those two later on uh, in the talk. Okay, uh, so the plan of action is I'll talk about what the symmetric case, which is gonna be the regular case, if you like. Uh, then I'll talk about these two patterns of, of consideration on the slide here. Then I'll talk briefly about what happens with three firms. And then I will sum up including talking about entry and mergers in these various markets. Okay, so that's the plan. What are interactions between firms in this Venn diagram world? Well, I haven't given you any real notation yet. Let me give you one little bit of notation. So you've got a subset of firms, S, the subset, and how many people consider all the firms in S? Uh, I'm gonna call that Sigma S. Okay, then they might consider other firms as well, uh, but they all the how many people consider firms one, three, and seven, and maybe others as well, that's going to be called sigma one, three, seven. Okay, so that's a, just a primitive in the model. That's just uh, my description of how many people are in the various segments of the Venn diagram. Uh, that's going to be a decreasing function of S in the set theory sense. Uh, what is S of I, you know, the number of people who consider only, uh, who consider firm I, that is going to be the reach of firm I, okay? It's the size of the number of people inside the whole circle in that Venn diagram. Okay, and so what's my ingredient, magic ingredient in this market? It is this gamma thing, which uh, it takes a bit of a second to disentangle what it is, but it's on the, Denominator is the fraction of people who consider all the firms in S. And underneath is the product of the, if you like, the marginal probabilities to consider each of the firms in S. Okay. So underneath on the, did I say I may have got denominator wrong there, but in the denominator, it's the product of sig all the sigma i's. So suppose 
gamma one, two with two firms. It's the number of people who see firms one and two jointly multiplied by the number of people who see firm one times the number of people who see firm two. Okay, so it is very close to a natural measure of correlation in this market. Uh, it is, you know, one particular measure of multivariate correlation. Uh, it's very difficult to talk about multivariate correlation, but this is what we're going to be using in this uh, paper with independent reach. So that's the Ireland and McAfee world. These gammas are all just equal to one. Okay. That's the uh, crucial factor of independent reach. Uh, gamma I is always just equal to one for an individual firm. That's just the same thing that on the top and the bottom of sigma. If two firms have correlated reach, then we're going to have gamma ij is bigger than one. If they're negatively correlated, gamma ij is going to be less than one. And if firms i and j have disjoint reach, like we had for some firms in the chain store world, then gamma ij is actually zero. Okay, so it's a way of capturing patterns of correlation in this market. Okay, and you know, you can uh, completely describe the pattern of consideration using the two kinds of variable, the reaches, how many reaches sigma one, sigma two, sigma three, and all the gammas. Those two families of parameters completely describe the pattern of consideration in the market. Okay, so just try and remember what sigma and gamma are in this uh, setup. So symmetric interactions just mean that gamma just depends on the number of firms being considered, not the identity of the firms being considered. Okay, so gamma S just to, so all pairwise interactions are the same, all triple interactions are the same, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and if you think about it, this includes all the familiar cases that the literature's described before. Uh, with duopoly, it trivially captures that. With symmetric randomly considered firms, it only depends on the number of firms in S, all of these things. So that's clearly in there. And independent reach, as I say, we have gamma S is always equal to one. So in particular satisfies this condition. So it does cover all the existing cases and a lot more, okay? Okay, but it does rule out lots of exotic things like those two Venn diagrams I had before. Okay, so let me just run through a few results now. Uh, I've got a bit over 15 minutes, so I can uh, now just run through. So what happens with symmetric interactions? What's the outcome in this case? Well, we, it's, uh, we can understand that. It's completely uh, easy to characterize it in this case. Okay, so suppose you've got symmetric interactions as I've described them, and we have a, this technical uh, thing that you have to have duopoly segments in the market so that there are at least some possibly tiny set of consumers that consider any given pair of firms in the market. I'll explain why that's needed in a second. Okay, suppose firms are labeled in order of increasing reach. So firm one is the smallest and firm N is the biggest. Then there is a unique equilibrium and it has interval price support. Each firm chooses its prices from an interval that's not disconnected or anything like that. And the minimum price P naught is the same for all firms. And it's in fact equal to the captive to reach ratio of the largest firm. And the maximum price of a firm goes up the larger the, the, the firm is. So a small firm has a starts at P naught and goes up to something a bit above that. The next smallest firm goes a bit higher than that. And in that, and in the end, the largest firm goes all the way up to one. So the, the Venn diagram for prices is nested, if you like. The you know, small firms have a small set of prices, big firms have a wide set of prices. It's not intrinsically interesting that firms choose the same minimum price as is the case here. It's not intrinsically interesting, but it's useful because it immediately shows us that the profits of the firms are proportional to their reaches. 
because a firm is willing to charge P0, in which case it serves its entire reach. So that tells us what its equilibrium profit has to be. So that's why it's uh, important to know that they all charge the same minimum price. Why do we have that duopoly thing there? Well, there's an, uh, an old paper by uh, Bay, Kovanok and de Vries, which shows that when you don't have those duopoly segments, then you're gonna have a whole continuum of equilibria in the market, okay? In particular, you might have two firms playing mixed strategies and all the rest of them setting a deterministic price of one, for instance, okay? And that's not possible when you have these duopoly segments because those firms choosing a price deterministically of one then have an incentive to undercut each other. So that duopoly bits knock out those uh, rather sort of uh, degenerate kinds of equilibria in the market. So that's why it's there. This pricing pattern is similar to independent reach, uh, but as I say, the underlying pattern is much more general than with independent reach. In particular, if you think about it, suppose you've got three firms, like I've had in my initial Venn diagram, it takes seven parameters to describe a most flexible pattern of consideration. That's the number of segments in the Venn diagram. Uh, if you impose symmetric interactions, then the all three pairwise things need to be the same. That's the restriction. And that means two degrees of freedom are knocked out. Uh, but with independent reach, you have to, you lose four degrees of freedom. So it's sort of twice as flexible as the independent reach case. Uh, these markets with symmetric interactions are intuitive with regard to exit and merger of firms. Uh, if you think about it, if you've got a, a market with symmetric interactions and one firm exits, then the new market also has symmetric interactions. So we can just work it out uh, neatly like that. So, and one can easily show that if you, a firm exits, then consumer surplus falls. Uh, likewise, if two firms profitably merge, then consumer surplus falls. Okay, so that's what you expect. That's what sort of, that's the uh, picture one has of antitrust in most markets. And that's satisfied in this sort of regular case of symmetric interactions here. Okay, uh, so this is the sort of, if you're happy to stick within this world, everything works neatly. Let me move beyond symmetric interactions. Can I just okay. quickly interrupt you? Yes, of course. So we, we have a question from Andre Vega. He's asking, perhaps you might want to say more about this at the end, but can you say something about what the distribution looks like or about the mean of the distribution of prices? Or is there something that interesting that you can say? I don't know if it's interesting, but I can tell you that larger firms have a higher, a lot higher average price. Uh, uh, that's sort of as you expect, because they all set the same minimum, minimum price but larger firms that have a higher maximum price. But in fact, you can show that, that uh, it, you, they do set higher average prices, okay? So that's not always true, but in this world, a, a, a bigger firm sets higher prices. If a okay. bigger firm in this world has higher captive to reach ratio, which is really the thing driving whether you set high prices in this world. Okay, thanks. So you have about 13 minutes left. Thank you. I will uh, speed up a little bit. Uh, let me just, so I'll, I won't do the nested one. I'll let me do the chain store one in this uh, case here. Uh, so um, go back to that picture. You remember one big circle surrounded by a sort of uh, disjoint smaller circles, like a sort of flower or something like that. That's the pattern of consideration here. And then the equilibrium is easy to characterize. Uh, suppose those smaller firms aren't all identical, otherwise we get into multiple equilibria. Uh, and suppose, so firm ends the big one. Firm one is the local firm with the biggest interaction. Firm two is the local firm with the next biggest interaction, etc. Then the unique equilibrium has the chain store using the full range of prices, P0 up to one. And that full range is partitioned into sub-intervals, each of which is used by one of the local firms. Okay, so we have a very different pattern of pricing. We have 
duopolistic pricing. Each price is used by only two firms in the market. Uh, and we also have a rather neat uh, translation of the underlying Venn diagram. You've got a, a big firm with a number of disjoint rivals. That's what the Venn diagram for the prices look like as well. The big firm chooses the whole range of prices and the prices used by the local stores don't overlap at all. Okay, so it's the same sort of pattern. And in economically, what's going on is that you've got the big firm sets its pattern of prices, its price distribution, and all the little firms pricing against that. And the firms with more interaction have more elastic demand and will choose lower prices. So that's why firms with more interaction uh, choose a lower price support, okay, and with no overlapping. Okay, so it's a very particular kind of pattern of pricing, but in fact, that can arise even when firms don't have disjoint sets. So I'll just uh, save time, I'll avoid the nested case. Let me just quickly say what happens with three firms. Uh, so three firms is, is, if you like, the first interesting, the easiest interesting case in this, uh, in this world. Uh, and one can completely sort of characterize it if you spend enough time doing it. Uh, what goes on here? Well, if you think about it, what have we seen so far? We've seen two kinds of equilibria. One where all firms have the same minimum price P naught and one where there's sort of duopolistic price competition, okay? Uh, and in fact, the nested case also has duopolistic price competition. And in fact, with three firms, those are the only options that you see in the market, okay? Again, forget the details of this thing here. Uh, there are only two possibilities. One in the top case uh, here, this is the case where pairwise interactions are relatively similar, then all firms have the same minimum price and therefore profits proportional to their reach. In the second case, the, the converse case, essentially the converse case, then one pair of firms is much more competitive than the other pairs of firms. Okay, and in that case, those two firms compete hard together, leaving the third firm free to set high prices. Okay, so that we have a duopolistic price competition. Two firm, the two competitive firms set low prices, and then the two less competitive firms set high prices. Uh, so that looks like the chain store world, even though uh, there's potentially full overlap between uh, all three firms. Okay, so in with three firms, there's only very limited kinds of uh, price competition that can emerge. Okay, you either have all at the bottom, or you have this. If they start off with two at the bottom, then it carries on being only two anywhere in the, in the whole range. Okay, so in particular, you can't have a world where two at the bottom and then a third firm comes in uh, uh, later on. Okay, so uh, uh, that's what happens there. Uh, so you can't, have a, you can't have a situation where one firm only sets middling prices, for instance. Okay, and the, the one wrinkle you might want to say is that in the first case, the case where overlaps are broadly similar, uh, then it is possible that the less competitive firm has a gap in its prices. So it doesn't use an interval like we had with the symmetric interactions. It, the less competitive firm only sets a, a low price or a high price, but nothing in the middle. So it's non-convex price support. That's the sort of wrinkle that one can get with triopoly. Uh, I've got uh, seven minutes. Uh, let me just say uh, what happens with merger and entry in this world. Uh, here we've got a what looks like a very tricksy kind of entry uh, in this Venn diagram, but I, hopefully I can persuade you that it's a perfectly natural way of thinking of entry. Suppose you've got two in symmetric, say, incumbent firms. That's the original two big circles on that Venn diagram. And when a third firm comes into this market, it's only considered by people who already considered both the incumbent firms, as shown here. Uh, why is that possibly natural? Well, think of who's, who are the people that are already in the overlap segment. They're the sort of savvy types patrolling the market, looking for good deals. And they're the only ones who are going to be willing to consider the entrant when it appears in the market as well. Okay, so I would say that uh, there is a 
perfectly sensible mode of entry to happen. Uh, I, let me just preempt something. I almost always get asked, why does the entrant choose to enter here? Uh, why, why wouldn't it be better going elsewhere? And that's just not the, that's not what this model is all about, okay? The model is that an entrant appears who considers it and the, the entrant can't affect that in this model. And it's going to only be considered by the savvy types uh, who are already taking care of themselves in the market. Okay, and the entrant can't do anything. It can't try and attract the captives or anything like that. It's not in its power. Uh, so that's the mode of entry here. What happens to prices in this world? Well, if you think about it, uh, the entrant doesn't eat into the captive segments of the incumbent. Uh, it's not going to affect the incumbent's profit because they can always get the captive segments anyway. Uh, it doesn't affect welfare because no new consumers are being reached by entry. But the entrant is certainly going to make money because the incumbents aren't going to be willing to go too low because they don't want to go below their captive to reach ratio, which is unchanged. So the entrant is going to make positive profits. The incumbent profits are unchanged. So industry profits go up with entry. Welfare is unchanged. Consumers are harmed by entry in this model. Okay. Clearly, this, for, this pattern of the Venn diagram is not one of symmetric interactions. If it was symmetric interactions, then we have a previous theorem that said that uh, exit would harm consumers, that i.e. entry would benefit consumers. So this, we have to have entry of a non-symmetric kind, and that's exactly what's going on here. Okay, so this is a sort of, I think, a natural case where entry uh, harms consumers. It clearly harms the captive people because it causes uh, the incumbents to retreat to their captive bases. But in fact, more perversely, it can actually harm the captive, the contested people as well. Okay. Uh, so that's the sort of what happens with entry. Mergers. Uh, can a profitable merger ever benefit consumers uh, using our exhaustive uh, um, triopoly analysis, we can show that a three to two merger is always going to harm consumers. Okay, there's no way it can, uh, anything weird can happen with three to two mergers. Uh, but with more firms, in fact, you can have interesting things going on. Suppose you have a merger between two firms with a, a strong interaction, for instance, who reach roughly the same pool of consumers, that's always going to be a profitable merger. That merger is going to cause the, that pair of firms to re increase its price. Okay, it's not, they're not competing against each other so fiercely as before. And that opens up, if you like, a profitable front for the remaining firms uh, to compete. And they're gonna, that might cause them to retreat, to enter uh, the fray and exit their captive base. And the result is that total profits can be reduced, okay? And consumers benefit. I won't go through it, but this is just an example in the paper to show that two firms merging can actually benefit consumers, okay? But you do need more than three firms for that to work. Conclusions? <clears throat> well, this is a, what we hope is a pretty parsimonious framework for talking about how patterns of consideration affect patterns of price competition. Uh, patterns of consideration are completely determined by two kinds of parameters, the reaches of each firm and how those reaches overlap, uh, which is described by these gamma parameters, the interaction parameters. So those two sets of parameters determine everything about the Venn diagram. Existing models in the literature fall under the general class of what we call symmetric interactions, which is where the gammas don't depend on the identity of firms, only the number of firms. Okay, and in all those uh, models, firms use the same minimum price and so profits are proportional to a firm's reach. We have e unique equilibrium, interval, price supports, everything quite standard like that. Outside that class, you have other things uh, possible. Uh, you can have disjoint reach or nested reach. 
you can have duopolistic price competition as well as head-to-head -head price competition. And not that I'm remotely working towards uh, empirical stuff in this paper, but you know there are richer patterns of prices than you get in the standard models that have been presented before. And presumably some of those patterns of prices might fit better empirical patterns of prices than the sort of Varian or uh, Burdett and Judd type models. Uh, finally, clearly it'd be nice to make consideration sets endogenous. I haven't done any of that in this paper. Advertising is an obvious way to do that, to boost your reach. I would say all pretty well, so that I can think of models of advertising in this kind of context assume reach is independent. Okay, so that's the sort of beautiful paper by Butters is the classic example of that, uh, but there's uh, uh, other papers as well with independent reach. You could just do exactly the same exercise, but have a richer pattern of consideration where the gammas aren't all equal to one. Okay, you could have nested reach or something like that. Okay, so you could just work out what, what's the equilibrium prices and advertising in a richer model that doesn't have independent reach. Finally, the very last thing is that you might have firms reaching their customers by a platform to use a fashionable kind of uh, way of looking at things. Uh, this platform might be funded by firms and or by consumers. Who funds it depends what that platform wants to do. Uh, and a platform might therefore have an incentive to affect the gammas in this market. Okay, and that sounds super abstract. What does that mean? That might mean, how can you affect the gammas? Well, you can do it by deciding what adverts might be shown together when consumers type in a particular search term or something like that. Okay, and why would it want to do that? Because it can stimulate or stifle competitions between firms in the market. On that uh, point, uh, important point, uh, let me stop for now. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks very much. So, um, so we now give the floor to Dirk Bergerman. Shall I stop sharing my? Oh, it has. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Okay. No, Dirk, we we can't hear you. And I unmute now. Okay. Yeah, you can hear me now? Yep. Great, good. Um, uh, so thank you, Emilio and Andrew, for giving me the occasion um, to talk about Mark's uh, and John's work. It's actually a little uh, bittersweet because I think the last academic event uh, that I had in meeting was uh, with the three of you together in New Haven, you know, in February. <laughs> and then a week after we shut down. So, yeah, so it's nice that's to right. see you yeah. again. <laughs> um, so this is a wonderful paper. Um, uh, very nice um, for me to read in detail. And actually, the the, the slides are, are are very good and give sort of a, um, I think a, a stronger sense of the paper than the than the current version of the paper. So let me just briefly tell you um, the the two key conditions or the two key definitions um, is in the way of describing. Uh, patterns, patterns of competitive interaction. We are saying that a customer is reached by firm I, if that customer considers firm I. Um, and so that customer I may consider firm I, but also others. And then we say a customer is captive to firm I, if that customer considers firm I, but no other firm. And uh, the, the key measure that then translates into profits and revenue is the ratio between captive and reach by each firm. Um, this leads to some very nice definitions um, and notions of how to describe the structure of the interaction among the firms. So um, think about any arbitrary set of numbers of firms. Uh, then we think about sigma s as a fraction of consumers who consider all the firms that are in s they can consider more. And um, clearly, I can also define sigma i to be the fraction who consider firm i and, and others. And a way to capture then 
the level of interaction is through this uh, nice ratio that, that varies between zero and, and plus infinity. Uh, that tells me that gamma s is the ratio between um, the fraction of consumers who consider s and the fraction of consumers who consider s if their consideration were to happen independently. So if it were the product of the individual considerations. And so um, one clearly gives us the representation of independence and sort of the measure and um, more than one gives us positive correlation to some extent, less than one gives us negative correlation, though it, it, it's more complicated than that. So it's um, a very nice, and, and as Mark showed um, you in many of the results, sort of the key measure to represent in some sense the, the network of interaction. And so I was struggling my mind a little bit to see where I have seen similar things or similar notions. And, um, and I, I must admit, I haven't. So I was going back in my mind and was thinking about, well, how would I have uh, formulated this notion? And you, you could think about um, very simple network definitions, because after all, it is a network of competing firms. And you could just have said, um, what's the probability or what's the weight that interaction between firm, firm I and firm J has, and that would then capture alpha IJ as the, the weight of the edge or the size of the edge. And um, this would give me sort of a natural matrix representation of networks as it's done uh, in network theory and various measures that I can then derive from this matrix that have to do with uh, the spectrum, the eigenvectors, the eigenvalues would give me um, different ways of summarizing the, the strengths of the competition or the connectedness of the network. Um, but in, right, so, so you, you may see, have seen pictures like that and I was trying to relate it, but actually um, it, it, the, the price competition is sort of a special network of bipartite matching where you, you basically have buyers matched to sellers and that's really uh, the key characterization. So um, the, the market is a bipartite matching. And so the measure that the gamma assets that um, Mark and John proposed are a measure to think about correlation and bipartite matching. And I, I, I didn't know about, so, so it might be worthwhile to think about whether people have thought about how to, cor how to think about correlation uh, in, in bipartite graphs. There's a lot of work in computer science on it, but, um, but, but I'm unaware of what would be sort of uh, the best connection and the best relation, or, or maybe this is actually a measure that might very well be um, of you know, further uh, importance uh, in the settings. Um, so, so that would give you also a different representation um, over and above the, the Venn diagrams, um, which give, you know, would, would think of um, introducing a second uh, perspective on it. Um, there's a, an interesting definition of the market being symmetric, meaning it depends only on the number of firms in S. Um, and while gamma S can be symmetric, uh, the reach of the firms can differ. So, there is, so it's, a, um, it's a nice restricted um, specific form of symmetry that otherwise allow asymmetry. I had a little bit of a hard time um, to figure out what would be sort of a natural probabilistic model or sort of a, a generating model that would give me differences in the in the sigma I let uh, generate symmetry in the gamma s's. So um, there, I, I guess I would ask for help to understand it or sort of think about what but the a leading example. The the model in some sense has an abundance of richness in the sense that there are various forms of interactions that share uh, then certain properties and others um, that then differ. And the prediction sometimes, you know, the, sort of the support prediction is independent, other predictions are more dependent. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering whether one could um, get some more ambitious result. One could, for example, ask, um, let me fix um, just the 
the, the reaches of each form as sort of as a basic data, but then there might be many possible forms of interaction structures, gamma S that are supported by the same basic data about the reaches of the firms. And might there be ways in which one sort of can summarize many of the results and say, are there low and upper bounds for revenue and consumer surplus uh, that hold for all possible interests interaction structures or possible gammas for a given, um, you know, a given reach of the consumers, which you may think is sort of primitive data. Um, and, and in fact, uh, that exercise could also be um, pursued for the question of entry, merge and exit, where one says, well, let me think about the fixed reach. Um, are there constellations in the interaction structures where entry, merger, exit are particular profitable, valuable, uh, or detrimental? And are there others uh, where it's not? So in order to, you know, bring, um, you know, <laughs> Mark said he's not going to do it, but other people might be interested in doing, bringing this to empirical work. It would be nice to say about what are sort of the bounds uh, that can and that hold uh, irrespective of the specific interaction structures. Um, those are my my sort of initial comments or observations. Thank you for giving me the chance to read this. Okay, thanks very much. So I think we only have a couple of minutes. We have a few questions in the chat, but I think maybe it's better if we pass those questions on to you and maybe you just want to spend a couple of minutes replying to Dirk's comments. Uh, yes, I can do that. Uh, you're exactly right that you could all, instead of my Venn diagram, which for some psychological reason I prefer to these bypass. <laughs> yeah, no, no. <laughs> uh, uh, but clearly that's another way of referring, much more general, flexible way of referring. You can only have a Venn diagram with a few circles on it really. Uh, so uh, it's, it's a better way of thinking about it in general. And I've often tried to have a link with the network literature, but I haven't quite been able to do it. Um, mm -hmm. So your matrix in a way focused very much on pairwise interactions between firms and and it's somehow important to go beyond just the pairwise interactions as well, uh, which is what the network people often do focus on. Um, uh, the bound, the, your last slide is uh, obviously edging close to your own research uh, territory as well. Uh, and it would, would be a fantastic thing to do. Uh, we have thought a bit about, you know, given the size, given circles of a various size, which mm -hmm. way of sliding them into a Venn diagram is best for consumers and uh, best for firms, which is your question really. Um, mm -hmm. But we haven't somehow, we haven't been able to get very clear cut results about that. Um, so we have tried, we haven't tried bounds exactly, but so you think about nested, the nested case has the most interaction for a given set of circles, the most overlap. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, it also reaches the fewest number of consumers in total. So there's a sort of two way, you know, in terms of prices are low, but uh, not many consumers are reached. So it's not very clear, easy to get clear cut results about, mm -hmm. about that overlap thing. Uh, but uh, I would love to be able to make more progress on that. And as you say, it would be a, a, an ambitious extra thing uh, to, do it, to do at some point. Um, thank you very much. Okay, thanks, so I think it's exactly 5 p.m. So we should probably stop now. So apologies if we didn't get a chance to read out your question, but we'll pass the chat on to Mark so that he will see the question. So thanks to Mark, Dirk, the organizers and the uh, all the participants and hope to see you next Wednesday. Thank you very much, Great, Andrew. Thank you. <laughs> okay, bye.